All right, good evening. It is a, a nice group, bigger, more folks than what we had last year, and we like to see conferences grow and um, see ministry expand and touch lives of others. And um, we're going to be going over some amazing things this weekend, some things that are very familiar to us, um, most of us, maybe not all of us. But um, even so, it's good to go over those things once again, because we hear them as, as we hear them communicated. It gives us maybe a little insight or little angles that we can communicate to others, uh, maybe a different perspective than what we've uh, become accustomed to in the past. So uh, we're going to have a good time this weekend, and uh, I appreciate the topic very, very, very much. Why is dispensational Bible study important? Um, take your Bible and open up with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number seven, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, we'll, we'll start there. Um, let's have a word of prayer before we begin our time in God's word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we've set aside uh, for this weekend, that we can look into your word and, and uh, discuss these things. And we thank you for the footprint that has been established here for the truth, uh, the truth of your word and, and holding it up in here in this community and the avenue of media and uh, whether it's recordings that are here or, or um, um, through the internet, Lord, we, we thank you. We don't know who will be impacted by this weekend. And Lord, number one, we pray that we're impacted by it and that we uh, bring glory to your son, the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Um, a, a Bible conference on dispensational Bible study. Greg was mentioning that there are a lot of people out there that dismiss and have contempt for what we do. A dispensational Bible study. I did some did some searches on the internet, and one of them came up. Um, John MacArthur out in California. Um, he was asked a question, and he classified himself as a leaky dispensationalist. And I don't even know really what that is, but he went on to say that basically uh, the proper understanding of dispensationalism is that uh, you recognize that there's a future for Israel, and that's about all. And uh, he says some people even go to the extreme of, of saying that, the, that, the, um, that there's certain books in the New Testament that are not for us today, that the Sermon on the Mount has nothing to do with the church, and some people take certain books of the Bible that are for the, for the nation of Israel and certain books of the Bible that are for uh, the church, the body of Christ. And he called that extreme. Sounds to me like he's been watching Forgotten Truths, because there's not too many dispensationalism, dispensationalists that talk that way. But um, it's, a, it's a wonderful topic. Um, many have contempt for it. Some even call it a cult or call it heresy or, or look at it as uh, something of a bygone era, like the buggy whip or the rotary phone um, type of thing that, have, that maybe one time served a purpose, it, it, but, but the church has progressed and um, the church has progressed. It's progressed downhill. Um, there's been, a, there's been a, a, a marked departure from truth and the final authority of God's word, and it's affected our culture. A lot of people talk about the, the, the decline in American culture. I think it corresponds with the decline in the church, the body of Christ, and its influence and its power, and, um, uh, and that's, that's to be expected. But we have in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, um, the word dispensation is a good Bible word. It, it occurs four times in the King James Bible, and so we're going to look at some things about it. Um, the root word of the word dispensation is dispense. It means to deal out. It means to, to pass out. Um, like, a, like a medicine dispensary. You go to the pharmacy, they have all kinds of medicines, but you want them to dispense the proper medicine for your prescription. You don't want them just to grab pills off the shelf. Um, those types of things. Post office has been an, been an example, been used. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse 17 is the first occurrence of the word dispensation in our Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 17. For I, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So we're going to consider this word dispensation. We're going to look at the, um, the four places in, the, in Paul's epistles that the word is found. It's actually found in a couple of other places as well. Um, but let me go back to, I'm, we're going to look at what is dispensational Bible study. I want to go back to the, to the title of the weekend. Uh, why is dispensational Bible study important? Because of a verse of scripture like this. Because dispensational Bible study leads us and opens up the scriptures to us to understand the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul. Because the, the Apostle Paul is the Apostle of the Gentiles, and he is laying out what God is doing today. 
and there's going to be several messages throughout the weekend about the contrasts uh, between uh, how Paul teaches us how, how it affects our giving, how it affects our Christian life, how it affects our local churches and our, our future and so on. Um, the most important reason for dispensational Bible study is because it gives clarity as to what God is doing today so that we can honor the Lord and, and, and really serve Him um, according to the truth that He's operating with today. Um, the English word dispensation, you do hear it occasionally. Um, Sometimes you'll hear the expression, a special, we're, we need a special dispensation. Uh, I think back and, and um, the example might not be totally, com totally accurate, but I think, I think back around 9-11, um, 2001, when the attack was in New York, I think it was Rudy Giuliani, he was the mayor, mayor of New York, and they, there was such chaos in the New, in the New York area and all the, the things that had to come together. Um, he, was a proc he was either going to be reelected or was leaving office for term limits or whatever. And there was consideration to grant a special dispensation so that he could continue on as mayor or serve in some capacity to help with the, you know, because he's got boots on the ground and, and is familiar with the, the, the inner workings of the New York City and, and uh, all, all of the things that needed to be taken care of there at that time. A special dispensation would be what? It would be making an exception to the norms and the standards or, a, or the procedures that were in place. A special, special exception for whatever particular reason. Um, so um, it, it, the word dispensation here, he, Paul says, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. The word means a management of a household, uh, the, managing the affairs of somebody else's property. Um, the, the word is also found over in the book of Luke where it talks about stewardship. There would be a householder, there would be a, the, the man that would have a plantation, have a, a large uh, section of land, and he would delegate to a steward to oversee the, 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 the paying of the, uh, of, the, of the salaries and the dispensing of the, of, of the affairs and paying the bills and, and uh, administering the affairs. That's, a, that's the idea of, of a, the administration of a household. Um, and when we talk about dispensational Bible study, what we're doing is we're tracking and taking note of the different ways that God has dealt with man down through time. A dispensation is not just a period of time. Uh, it can be characterized by a period of time, but it's really the idea of a, a specific set of instructions or, or an administration or a particular type of management of a household. Think of it like this. Um, a couple of illustrations. If you like sports, how many of you here like, like sports, like athletics? Okay, not too many. If you say, <laughs> but, but you'll, get, you'll get the point. If you say, I like sports, that's kind of like saying, I like Bible study. Sports are, sports covers, there's a lot of different sports, aren't there? Um, there are some sports that are very similar. You've got tennis and volleyball. Both of them have a net. Both of them, um, the idea is to score points by, you know, tapping it over the net and the other person can't make the, can't make the, 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 keep, the keep the ball in bounds. But there's different rules. You would not want to take the rules of volleyball and apply them to tennis just because they're similar. Um, tennis allows the ball to bounce once. Volleyball doesn't allow it to bounce at all. Um, different, different rules, but, but if you don't have the, if you, you have the different types of rules, there's other sports that are similar, like hockey and soccer. Hockey has five players plus a goalie. I think soccer has 11 plus a goalie. Um, they both have a net. They both have a center line. You can have offsides. Uh, you're trying to score a goal. The other, the other team is defending a goal, but they're different sports, and you wouldn't want to try to play you want, wouldn't want to play soccer with the rules of hockey. Just because there's similarities, if you don't recognize the difference, there's chaos and there's confusion, isn't there? Um, hockey, there's actually collisions that are sanctions, part of the rules. You can body check. You can throw your body into, into the competitor to, to gain an advantage to, to control the puck. But in soccer, you do that and there's a penalty. It's just different rules. You also have different sports altogether. Can you imagine the chaos if you had a basketball game and 11 guys walk onto the floor in pads and helmets and cleats and are going to try? It, it would be total chaos, wouldn't it? Well, the Bible is the same way. If you don't recognize that there are some things in the scripture that are similar, but there are different people, there are different programs, there are different purposes. Really, when you talk about 
when you talk about sports, there's all different types of games and, you know, athletic competition. But in the Bible, there's really only two purposes. There, there's one great purpose that God has to the Lord Christ in two realms. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so really, it's not, it's not as complicated as sports with all the different rules and all the different nuances. You really only have two purposes. That's why we talk about it in 2 Timothy 2.15 to do what? Rightly divide the word of truth, recognizing those, those, those terms. And the Bible is like that. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, so we, we, the concept of, of a dispensation is a management of a household. Um, I, I, I keep coming back to the thing about sports. I played baseball in high, in high school. And before the game, the captains would meet with the umpires and the coaches, and they would go over the ground rules. Now, the ground rules were not the same in every single stadium or every single field that you played. It would, ground rules were special uh, factors should there be an overthrow and where it would go if it would get caught in the fence or if it would go past a certain line. Some, some ball fields had a, had a home run fence in the back. Some, you know, so if the ball bounced over, it was considered a ground rule double. And, and there was all these different factors, but, the, but the, the management, the administration, it was still baseball, but there were different, different rules accordingly. And so when, when we study the Bible dispensationally, we are tracking and noting the different ways that God has dealt with people down through time. So here we have in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse 17. He says, for if I do this, this is the Apostle Paul, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. I want to look at the last half of that verse and just consider for a minute the, the, the phraseology there. There are four elements to that statement. He says, a, that is a particular, something particular, a dispensation. That's the, the management, the administration, the, the house rules, so to speak. Um, the, the principles governing uh, the, the management of a household. A dispensation of the gospel. What's the gospel? Then he says, is committed unto me. So if you read that, is a special, unique, particular dispensation management uh, set of rules, set of instructions committed to the Apostle Paul. That's unique as compared to the rest of the Word of God? And the answer is yes. And as you look at that verse and as you just walk through it, and then you compare Scripture, things are different, aren't they? People today say things that's all the same. The difference is the, the, the basic philosophy is dispensational changes as compared to covenant theology. One program, one purpose, one people all the way through the Bible. Failure to recognize the distinctions. And when you handle the Bible that way, the literal reading of the scripture goes right out the window. And you're taking it, you're taking it literal sometimes when, um, uh, when it's speaking perhaps figuratively. People get go off in all different directions. But most of the time, when people come to those hard verses, they spiritualize them. And the person in the pew, and the, the person in the church, or the, the person at home watching on television, doesn't know if they can take the Bible at face value or not. And when they try, um, it doesn't work, and they get frustrated. And there's been multiple, t dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people through the years who've been frustrated because they know that they have a, they have a faith in God. They know that there's a Creator. They know the Bible's the Word of God, but have been led astray and been confused and been frustrated and just throw up their hands and say, "I can't figure this thing out." And God never wrote His Word for that way, for in that in that vein. He wrote His Word to be understood. He wrote the Word. The Scripture was written by common people for the common man to understand God's purpose so that they can walk in faith and serve him. So let's just look at first, first these four elements in verse number 17 here. I want to start with the issue of the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news, right? Did Paul have a particular gospel message? Come with me to the book of Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. Um, the gospel centers in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter number one. As Paul is discussing his apostleship and his message and ministry, 
He says in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. What's the gospel of God? Well, he goes on to say, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The gospel of God, that's a general term. All of God's good news is centered where? In the person of his son. You go way back to the book of Genesis chapter number three and you're not reading very far at all. And it talks about the seed of the woman going to, going to, going to bruise the, the head of the serpent and so on. And uh, the, the person of Jesus Christ is the, is the focal point in that promise uh, back in the book of Genesis. All of God's good news is centered in his son. Verse 4, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. He's the son of God. He's, he conquered death and rose from the grave the, the third day because um, death could not claim him, could not hold him. Verse number 5, by whom... We have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among who? All nations for his name. Paul was a, was a minister. He was an apostle of the, of the good news concerning Jesus Christ. And his apostleship had, a, had a, a, an unrestricted element to it. He was, he was commissioned to go to all nations, including fallen and unbelieving Israel. He had an unrestricted, broad apostleship. So first and foremost, Paul had a, had a unique apostleship. He, he, his gospel concerned Jesus Christ. It was, it was to be taken to all the nations. Come to Romans chapter number 11, looking some more at, at, the, at the apostle Paul and his ministry. Paul, in his apostleship, he was to go to all nations, but he gives us some special information about Jesus, uh, uh, about the nation of Israel. He it informs us and lets us know that the nation of Israel has a different status at the time of his ministry than previous. He says in verse 11 of Romans 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, well, the nation of Israel did fall. Through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, he says it, says it three times in that verse. In those two verses, the nation of Israel during Paul's ministry has a different status than it had during the time previous to his life and, and to his ministry. Is that a change in God's administration, a change in the way he's dealing with the world, a change in the way he's dealing with with mankind? Absolutely. So Paul's ministry has to do with a different status for the nation of Israel in, in relationship to the Gentiles. He says over and over again that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile, we're all, that we're all one in Christ when we come to the cross work and we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. They're, they're equal as sinners, they all stand and the whole world is guilty before God, Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, there's no difference, that hasn't always been the case. That's, there's a change, there's a, there's a progression, there's, a, there's an altering of God's dealings with the world. That's, dis that's dispensationalism, and it's recognizing that that is a fact and recognizing when and where those, those changes took place. So there is a, a different status for the nation of Israel in Paul's gospel, in Paul's ministry. Go to Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter 16. Paul preached the gospel of Christ. He preached the good news concerning Jesus Christ. A different status for the nation of Israel. He says in Romans chapter 16 and verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Paul preaches new information, some previously unrevealed information about Jesus Christ that was kept secret for how long? From time immemorial since the world began. That means Paul got some new information. He got some information other people hadn't had previous. He talks about his gospel. He talks about the preaching of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He takes the cross work and opens it up and explains the good news of the cross work. Come to Romans chapter, or 1 Corinthians. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Just now, what we're doing is we're looking, did the Apostle Paul have a special 
dispensation, a special administration of the gospel committed unto him? The answer is yes. He preached to, he had a, 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 an unrestricted apostleship, preaching to the world. He preached some, some new information about Jesus Christ. Um, we know he talks about the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. The cross work of Jesus Christ in Paul's gospel is good news. He says over in 1 Corinthians 15, I declare unto you the gospel which I received, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He died for us. He died as a substitute. He shed his blood and, and paid the redemption, paid the price for sin for all mankind and satisfied the justice of God. And that's good news. The cross is not an unrevealed event. It's prophesied back in the Old Testament. It's talked about even in the four Gospels. We'll look at that in a minute. But it's not proclaimed as good news. It's the very heart of Paul's message. And it's the, it's, he says the Gospel that he was sent, not with wisdom of words, but the preaching of the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As the, as the full and complete payment for all man's sins. He says Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sins. In Matthew chapter 20, he gave his life a ransom for many. But what does the Apostle Paul say over in 1 Timothy? He gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's something new. That's something different. He says, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle and a preacher uh, of the Gentiles. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. That's new information. You don't find that in the, in the four Gospels. You don't find that in the early chapters of the book of Acts. That's new information. And so the Apostle Paul preaches the cross as good news. Proclaims the, to, good news to the Gentiles. And he's forming a new agency called the church, the body of Christ. We'll see that um, uh, a little bit later. Come back to Romans chapter 15. Now, I know that these things are familiar to us, but, I, but these things are thrilling to me. These are such basic truths that people need to hear and need to rejoice in because it makes the Bible come alive. It makes the Bible a book that the common man can read and understand and enjoy. We've seen just a couple of basic things about, about Paul's apostleship and the gospel that he preached. Did he have a unique message in ministry? Well, Romans chapter 15, verse 8, Paul gives us some perspective on the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, did he came? He came unto who? His own. He says over and over again, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he loved the world, but he came in a specific contest. He was a minister of the circumcision. It says, for the truth of God. Listen, this is the word of truth, is it not? The Bible's true from one end of it to the other. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching truth. And the Apostle Paul was preaching the truth. Um, but, the, but just at face value, when you look and you see these, these messages are different. Um, he says, for the truth of God, the Lord Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. What were those promises? Those were covenants and promises that God made to the fathers, the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. You come here to the, to, the, to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth. He came confirming the promises made unto the fathers. And those revolved coven, in, rev, involved covenants and promises. God made a covenant with Abraham that he was going to make a great nation and give that nation a land. And that nation was going to be a blessing to the entire world. He made a covenant to David concerning a, a, a throne and a kingdom and a, 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 and a seed line that was going to be an everlasting kingdom and an everlasting throne. And Jesus comes confirming those promises made unto the fathers. He's a minister of the circumcision. Come and look at 
Now, come back to Matthew chapter number um, 4. Matthew chapter 4. In the book of Matthew, as the Lord begins his public ministry. By the way, Matthew picks it up at a different time. The Lord has already had extensive ministry, according to the Gospel of John, um, southern in, down in Judea. Uh, but Matthew picks up the narrative of beginning his Galilean ministry up north. He says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, from that time, from what time? From the time that John the Baptist is cast into prison. Um, John has, has ministry and, 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 and influence in the first four or five chapters of the Gospel of John, but eventually is, is cast into prison. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's a summation of the covenants and the promises made unto the fathers. Those covenants and those promises pointed toward the establishment of the nation of Israel on the earth in a literal, physical kingdom to be established in, in Israel's land. And Israel was going to be a channel of blessing to, to the entire world through, th and, and through them and through their Messiah. When he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we lay that right next to John uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 8, and it's the covenants and the promises that have been spoken since the world began. And verse number 18 and 19, Jesus begins to call some men to work alongside of him. Um, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So there's Peter and Andrew. And then verse uh, um, 20, they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they uh, immediately left the ship and their father followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching and preaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel. There it is. There's the word. The gospel, the good news of the kingdom, represented by the covenants and promises that have been made, that now the time has come for those to be fulfilled, and the king is in their midst, and the time is at hand, according to that timetable. And so he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. The Lord Jesus Christ is ministering. He's confirming those promises and saying the time is now for those promises to begin to come to fruition. Come to Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. You have the, you have the early ministry of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have his platform in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where the Sermon on the Mount, and he's giving the constitution of the kingdom in accordance with, it's, 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 it's going to be in accordance with those covenants and promises coming to fruition. You have Matthew chapter 8 and 9, you have the power of the king with 10 selective miracles that demonstrate the, 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 the credentials that he is the Messiah. And now you have the laborers of the king. Matthew chapter number 10, verses 2 to 4, you have those, uh, those disciples become apostles. And the Lord Jesus Christ now is going to, in verse 5, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Now you read verse 5, is that different than the Apostle Paul being sent to? Absolutely. That is a difference, a major difference, a difference in scope, a difference in context, because he says, verse 6, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What having its administration declared here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What house management and the affairs of that house is being declared to us? The nation of Israel and their, and their covenants and their promises. And so right away you see a distinct difference. At least as far up to, up to this point in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have a restricted apostleship by the Lord Jesus Christ and a restricted apostleship and ministry by the 12 apostles up to this point. Paul had an unrestricted apostleship and Paul was preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Some new information proclaimed. Come to Matthew chapter number, um, Matthew chapter number 
16. And these are familiar verses, but the, the, this is the elephant in the room. And when you see people teach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as though it's doctrine for today and doctrine for the church, how can they be preaching doctrine for the church when they're not even talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Here we see in Matthew chapter 16, for, for quite some time the apostles have been ministering. And in verse 21 of Matthew 16, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Isn't that the cross? Isn't that the event of the, the crucifixion and the death and the, and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Sure, same event. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Yet they're preaching a gospel. They've been sent preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven at hand with no blood atonement. That's, that's not an elephant in the room. That's something, I don't know if you've got a bigger animal than that. But it's just obvious. That is a difference. You can't say it's the same. It's a different. The apostle Paul had a, had a distinct gospel message that was given to him. And here there's no crosswork. And by the way, when they're initially sent out in Matthew chapter 10, there's no mention of the death, burial, and resurrection. They're preaching the throne and the king and the kingdom. And the time is at hand. A different program and a different message. No crosswork. Preaching to the nation of Israel. Come to the book of Acts. Acts chapter, Acts chapter number 3. Acts chapter number 3. After the crucifixion. Um, we do have the Great Commission, so-called. I mean, um, in our mid studies, I just started to chapter number 10, and I call that the Great Commission. That is the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 10 takes the apostle ministry from that point and takes it all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. He says in Matthew chapter number 10, you're going to go out and you're going to go from one city to another and they're going to persecute you in, in this city, but you're not going to get out of all the cities of Israel until the Son of Man become. Their ministry takes them from that point all the way through the, the 70th week to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's a, they're given the great commission right here in Matthew chapter number 10. The commission, the post-resurrection commission of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 28, in Mark chapter 16, in Luke chapter 24, and in John chapter 20 is an appendix to the, to the great commission given in Matthew chapter number 10. And it needs, those, those records need to not just be lifted out of their context, they need to be viewed in the setting of what the Lord gave to the apostles back here. The issue of the kingdom, the issue of the wrath to come, and the issue of the, the second coming of Jesus Christ back to the earth. Now their ministry does expand, and they, the, the, the program go into all the world and preach the gospel. But Matthew chapter 24 says that that, that that gospel of the kingdom is a witness to the nations. It's a message uh, concerning Israel and their program. We get over here into Acts chapter number Two and three, and the day of Pentecost, and, and Peter begins to preach, and you see in Matthew chapter number, or Acts chapter three, and verse number seventeen, Peter preaching subsequent to the day of Pentecost, he says in verse nineteen, "Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you." whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The message even here in early, the early chapters of the book of Acts is in accordance with prophecy. It's in accordance with the promises and the covenants that have been made under the fathers in the Old Testament. And now the time is, is, is fast approaching for all of those things to, to come to fruition. And the program here is still the nation of Israel. Um, verse number 24. Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, and as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant, 
which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God having raised up his son, sent him to bless you. Who is the you? The children of the covenants and the promises. It's still the nation of Israel and her program. They still have that place of privilege and blessing there. And priority and the covenants and promises are in view. Unto you first, God having raised up his son, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. You still have the prophetic program. Paul is preaching a ministry to the Gentiles, a ministry of no difference, a ministry of the fall of Israel. Like Israel has fallen here. They haven't been set aside. They're given a glorious second chance here um, in, in response to the prayer of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Come to Acts chapter number um, 26. Acts chapter number 26. He says, all the prophets in Acts 3 there have likewise foretold of these days, of the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, the stone that was going to be rejected for the builder, the, 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 the 12 apostles who were for signs and wonders in Israel. And the, the, the last days of the Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost, according to the prophet Joel. And the, 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 the great and notable day of the Lord that was coming. All of those things were in view. And yet, do, did those things come to fruition? Did those things come to pass? Did we see the wrath? Did we see the second coming of Jesus Christ? And do we see a literal, physical kingdom established in Jerusalem? according to the covenants and promises made unto the fathers? Absolutely not. Something happened. And it's not all one program. God had a new purpose. Did the Apostle Paul have a special and distinct and ministry, a dispensation of the gospel given unto him? Absolutely. Acts chapter number 26. Acts chapter 26 and verse 15. Here he's recounting his conversion. Um, and his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. we we'll pick the narrative up here in verse number 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen. What did he see? He saw the risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. The things which thou hast seen. And of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Paul got some information there in Damascus. And the Lord says right from the get-go, I'm going to give you some more. I'm going to appear to you again. And I'm going to give you a series. I'm going to give you some more information. First, in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the abundance of the revelations. In a series of personal encounters with Jesus Christ, Paul gets a dispensation of the gospel given unto him. A message that was previously unrevealed about some prophetic events. <laughs> about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but some, some, some new meaning to it. A new scope for it to be preached. And a new, new, new context and a new setting, a new administration, a new set of house rules, if you want to say that. And he says, the things I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Paul, right from the get-go, was sent to who? The Gentiles. He had a Gentile ministry and an unrestrict, unrestricted apostleship. I don't see a clock in here. What time are we supposed to be? What time are we supposed to be done? Sorry? Okay, we can do that. A, a series of revelations. There was a change. Come to the book of Ephesians with me. Most of the time when we teach these dispensational things, we start here. But um, we're going to come to Ephesians chapter number two. Dispensational Bible study is tracking the changes in mankind here on the earth and his plan and his purpose and recognizing the people through whom he's dealing with and the messengers that are that are being um, that are conveying his message Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh 
who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's why we look at uh, where we look at when the Apostle Paul talks about time past. And there was this division, there was this distinction between Israel and the Gentiles. And Israel had covenants and promises, and the Gentiles were aliens and strangers. They were on the other side of that middle wall of partition. And these people had covenants and promises. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes to confirm those promises in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he, he, the, the kingdom is now at hand. And it's been spoken since the world began. But then you read in verse number 13, one of the first two words. But now. What a, what a, what a, a contrast. What a, what a remarkable statement that is. We see time past that had a, had a program revealed, a, a purpose for the nation of Israel that was going to culminate in some wrath here on the earth to the, uh, and, and, and the exalting of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and, the, and the putting down of Gentile rule and power and the establishment of a literal physical kingdom. But that kingdom didn't come and the wrath didn't come. What came but now? And we open up our chart here and we see that God had a secret. He had a special dispensation of the gospel committed to the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the, the nations, and sent him out with a message of grace, a message of the fall of the nation of Israel and the setting aside of them temporarily while God forms a new agency called the church, the body of Christ. And, Paul, and God gave a special dispensation of the gospel to him. You see in, in verse 14, he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There is no distinction any longer. The nation of Israel doesn't have that special status. They have a changed status there. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. People didn't like it. They were odds. They were, there, were, there was hostility between them. He's, he's abolished the enmity. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making what? Peace. You go from hostility and division to now oneness and grace. And that middle wall of partition is broken down and there is a new agency formed. The church, the body of Christ. Israel's program and those apostles, they continued. Their hope didn't change. That's why you have some books over here, Hebrews to Revelation, where those apostles, they, did, they, weren't, they, didn't, they weren't brought into this program through the front door or through the back door. Their program remained intact. But God forms a new agency now called the church, the body of Christ. And he says... Verse 16, verse 15, making a new man. Verse 16, and that reconciled both unto God in one body. How? By the cross. There's some new information about a prophetic event. How God took the merits of Calvary and, in, and, and opened it up to the Gentiles and set the nation of Israel aside and interrupted those covenants and promises so that he, instead of wrath and vengeance on this world, he could show long-suffering and grace for now 2,000 years. What a glorious thing that is. And then he says in verse 17, And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off. Who are the people that were afar off? It's those Gentiles down there. They were on the other side of that wall of partition. To them that were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Who was near? The nation of Israel. If they were nigh, what does that tell you? They're not any longer. There's no difference. Different status. There's been a change. That's why he says in Ephesians chapter 3 here, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, the administration of a new household called the church, the body of Christ. 
and it's the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. How that by, excuse me, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, some information about Jesus Christ that was previously unknown, which in other ages was not made known. You know the rest of the passage. But you read the rest of the passage. Has there been a change? Is God now doing something different? Absolutely. Is he doing something different and unique with the Apostle Paul? He gave him a special dispensation of the gospel, didn't he? One more quick verse. Go over to, first, go over to Colossians chapter number 1. Ephesians, see if I can straighten that out a little bit. Ephesians chapter 3 is the second place, or one, of the, one of the places that, 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 that we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1 here to finish up. But here's another place. Here's a third place where that word dispensation is found. Here in um, the Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, talking about the body of Christ and Paul being a minister. He says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to me for you to fulfill, to complete, to fill up. The word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Did Paul receive a special dispensation of the gospel? Absolutely. And when God finished that revelation to the apostle Paul and Paul committed it to paper, God's word was complete. There is no further revelation any longer. All scripture is given now and thoroughly furnishes the man of God into all good works. And it's a wonderful, wonderful principle. Lastly, Come to the book of Ephesians chapter number 1. Here's another place. We've looked at, here's, it's actually the second time it occurs, but, but uh, I've, I've chose this one last because this is the ages to come, the future. He talks about the mystery of his will there in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Is there a future? Is there something going to take place out there in the ages to come where there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth and no more second death and no more sickness and no more disease and everything's going to be gathered together in one in Christ Jesus? That's going to be a glorious time. I don't know if I understand all I know about it or know all I understand about it, <laughs> but it's going to be a wonderful... Is that going to be something different than this whole world that we live in right now? Absolutely. Dispensational Bible study is tracking the progression, the, the progression of unfolding of God and his will and his purpose, tracking the distinctions that, that he reveals and the changes in his program with man and finding out where we stand today. Why is dispensational Bible study important? Because we learn what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. And God... We can let God be true and every man a liar and let the Bible be the Bible. Amen? Amen? And it's a glorious thing to be able to understand God's word. God wrote it for simple people and we can get it and other people can get it. And it's a shame that, that, that God's word has fallen into such, such repute and such, such uh, uh, chaos. But we have a clear message and it revolves understanding where we fit and we, where we stand today through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you know the Lord as your personal Savior. This gospel here is a glorious gospel that plugs us into God's purpose, but it's by simple faith in recognizing that you're the sinner for whom Christ died. And that's a message to all men everywhere. We have an unrestricted Savior. We have a total provision that's ours by simply resting and trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Father, thank you for this time we can spend in your word, this time this weekend, that we can study the distinctions in your word and we can gain clarity and understanding. But Father, not just so that we can tie it all into a nice, neat package and, and put a bow around it, but to gain some understanding and to go forth with, with conviction and clarity in a world that, uh, that needs a clear message, that needs our Savior. And to the church, the body of Christ, and other, other believers who need clarity um, to, to gain uh, understanding and appreciation of who our Savior is and who we are in Him. And we thank you. 
because dispensational Bible study is important. It's important to you because you want your word made known in truth according to what you're doing today. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray.